For Earth Day this year, I teamed up with other smart home YouTubers to participate in the 2022 Energy Challenge, where we're going to be showing you how to reduce energy consumption using smart home technology. Today on The Hookup, we're going to take a surprising look at the largest energy consumers in a typical house. I'm going to show you how to safely automate high power devices using something called a contactor. And then after that, we'll tabulate the data to see how much energy we were able to save. Step one in reducing your energy consumption is figuring out what consumes the most energy. Living in Florida, I would expect a large portion of my energy usage to be my air conditioning. And using the Sense Energy Monitor, I was able to confirm that that accounts for a little under 20% of my average monthly usage, which is a lot, but not quite as much as I expected. After that, it's common for people to talk about turning off the lights in order to conserve energy. But with LED technology, that's a little bit less impactful. And in my house, I only have around 500 watts of lighting in total. And on average, we only use around 150 watts of that, which is surprisingly low. But you know what isn't surprisingly low? According to the Sense Energy Monitor, my water heater counts for over 10% of my home's energy usage. That means that just heating the water for three showers a day uses an average of nine kilowatt hours. And when the water heater turns on, it pulls over 4,500 watts. To put that into a little bit of perspective, my water heater uses more energy in one minute than my kitchen lights use in two and a half hours. If I can reduce the amount of time that my water heater runs by just 36 minutes a day, I can completely negate the typical energy usage of the lights in my house. If you're not from the US, you might be shaking your head right now and saying, yeah, no kidding, since it's common in other countries to turn water heaters on and off. But typically here in the US, water heaters are direct wired and they run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So with that said, there are three goals for this video. First, I'm gonna show you how to safely add smart functionality to a high current device like a water heater. Second, I'll show you how I automated my water heater schedule to reduce unnecessary energy consumption. And third, we'll take a look at the actual impact of those automations and determine how long it will take for this project to pay for itself. Let's get started. In the US, water heaters are typically 240 volt split phase, and they're generally not wired with a neutral. That means that at the water heater itself, you're gonna have a black wire that's one phase of your 120 volt supply, and then either a white wire or a red wire that's the other 120 volt phase. If you've got a white wire, it will probably be wrapped in black electrical tape to signify that it is a hot wire and not neutral. My water heater is marked at 4,500 watts, which at 240 volts would be 18.75 amps. But in the Sense app, I've seen that wattage spike as high as 4,800 watts, which would be 20 amps. And for that reason, we are not gonna rely on any smart switch or relay to pass all that current, because even if it was rated for 20 amps, you really shouldn't run them continuously at full rating. Instead, we're gonna use a contactor, which is basically a high current, heavy duty relay, and we'll control it using an inexpensive Wi-Fi relay called the Shelly 1PM. Some other supplies that I used for this project are a UL rated metal electrical box, a pre-made wire whip with 10 gauge wire, some lower gauge red and black wire, and some miscellaneous wire connectors. Amazon links for the exact parts that I used are down in the description. So here's a basic rundown of the wiring and how a contactor works. On one side, you've got big terminals for your supply voltage, and then on the opposite side are more big terminals for your output voltage. The other two sides have the terminals that power an electromagnetic coil that's used to turn the contactor on and off. You can see that on this contactor, the coil voltage is 240 volts because that's what we have available to us at the water heater. But if you were automating a high current 120 volt device, you'd wanna get a 120 volt coil instead. These extra copper terminals on either side are sometimes called accessory terminals, and they're gonna allow you to run other low current devices off either the supply voltage or the output voltage. And we're gonna use them to connect our Shelly relay. To wire it up, the supply voltage comes in with 120 volts on each wire, and it connects to one side of the contactor in the big screw terminals. Then we're gonna use the accessory connectors to power our Shelly 1PM by hooking up the black wire to the L1 terminal and the red wire to N. Do not connect the red wire to L2 because they are internally connected in the Shelly, and that would result in a 240 volt dead short, a blown circuit breaker, and a dead Shelly device. The L1 terminal of the Shelly will output its voltage to the O terminal when the relay is on. So we're gonna connect the O terminal to one of the coil terminals on the contactor. The other coil terminal will just get the other phase of the supply voltage. So I'll use a short length of red wire with some spade connectors to make a jumper wire from the red accessory terminal to the other coil terminal. 
I have a crimper and a set of spade connectors that I bought from Amazon for about 50 bucks, but I'm not going to include that in the total cost since I bought them to rewire my boat, and if you want to save a little bit of money, you can solder the wires onto the contactor and then cover them with heat shrink. But the spade connectors do make everything look really nice, and if you're like me, you use every DIY project as an excuse to buy new tools. And these are two that I would highly recommend. The decent set of terminal crimpers and a decent set of ferrule crimpers. Anyways, wired like this, the Shelly receives constant power. And then when we turn on the Shelly relay, it will supply the second phase to the coil, which activates the contactor and passes both phases through the contactor to the output terminals. This contactor is rated at 40 amps, so even at 4,800 watts, we're gonna be using it at less than half of its rated capacity, which is good practice. I wired as much of this as I could over on the workbench before I moved over to the water heater. And after I finished, it looked something like this. I ended up punching two holes out of the top because I wasn't sure if the metal box was gonna block Wi-Fi signal on the Shelly, but it turned out to not be an issue and I was able to have the Shelly inside the box like I wanted to. Next, it was time to move over to the water heater. And for this step, you'll absolutely need to turn off the power of the circuit breaker. Do not skip this step. In fact, not only should you flip the breaker, but also double check the wires with the multimeter afterwards to make sure that they're off. 240 volts will kill you, and I am not joking about that. Find a good place on the wall to mount your box and be very careful because behind the wall of your water heater, there's usually a bunch of water pipes that you don't want to put a screw through. To be extra careful, I use drywall anchors and non-self-tapping screws to lower the risk of puncturing a pipe. Once you've got that mounted, disconnect the existing wires from your water heater and then thread them into your new electrical box using the existing conduit connectors. You'll probably need to shorten your flex conduit here and a good way to do that is to unwrap it with some vice grips and channel locks and then after unwrapping it, you can use diagonal cutters or snips to cut off the flex without damaging the cable inside. After that, just wrap the end in a little bit of electrical tape to protect it from any sharp edges. Those wires are gonna be the supply voltage for your contactor. So give yourself a loop or two of extra wire inside the box and then screw them into the contactor. If you had to shorten up the white wire, you should also wrap the last six inches in black electrical tape to signify that it is a hot wire and not neutral. Next, snake your new conduit down to your water heater and attach the black to black, red to red, and then ground the green wire to the screw on top of the water heater. If you need to shorten this type of flexible conduit, the best way to do that is to score the outside with a utility knife and then twist or bend it until it snaps. That way you won't damage the wires inside. The last connection you need to make is to attach the ground wires inside the metal box. So grab an appropriately sized wire nut and connect those two together. At this point, you should make one last quick inspection of your connections and then flip the breaker back on. Your Shelly device should power up and broadcast a wireless network that you can connect to with your phone. Then go to 192.168.33.1 to get to the Shelly web interface. From there, you'll be able to toggle the relay on, which should close the contactor and provide 240 volts to your water heater. You can see that it takes roughly four watts continuous to close the contactor, so we'll need to account for that later in our final cost analysis. Next, go into the Shelly app and enter your Wi-Fi settings. Once connected, you can update the firmware to get the latest features. Like all Shelly devices, the Shelly 1PM can operate 100% locally, or you could connect it up to the Shelly Cloud, which would then give you access to Amazon Echo Control. Even without cloud access, there are a bunch of advanced features and scheduling within the web interface, which might be enough for you. But I wanted to do a bit more automation, so I used Home Assistant and Node-RED to get a little bit fancier. Shelly devices are automatically discovered and set up in Home Assistant, so once I clicked on the button to add it, I could automate it however I wanted. Home Assistant automations have come a long way in the last year, but for me, they're still a little bit confusing. So I decided to use Node Red with the Light Scheduler node to make it dead simple. During the week, the water heater needs to turn on at 4 a.m. to have the hot water ready for my wife's morning shower. And I should be showered and ready by 7.30, so we can shut the water heater off then. I also need it to turn back on at 6 p.m. to be ready for my daughter's nightly shower, and then back off at 7.30 p.m. for a total of five hours of runtime per day. During the weekends, our schedule isn't nearly as predictable, so I'll keep the water heater on from Saturday morning until Sunday night. And just like a number of other automations in our house, I wanna be able to ignore the schedule and keep the water heater on whenever we have house guests, and I wanna be able to keep the water heater off when the house is in vacation mode. Now, there are clearly lots of factors that will change how much energy your water heater uses. Things like the temperature of the incoming water, the location and insulation of the water heater, and how much hot water you use per day. But in Florida, with my water heater installed in the garage and three people taking one shower a day, my typical water heater usage is just over nine kilowatt hours per day before the automation. After automating, the typical usage is just under seven kilowatt hours a day. And that means we're saving 2.2 kilowatt hours per weekday on average. 
However, I also need to account for the additional energy consumption of the contactor, which consumes 4 watts anytime the water heater is on, for a total of 12.6 kilowatt hours per year. And then there's also the Shelly, which consumes around 750 milliwatts all the time, which works out to 6.5 kilowatt hours a year. So in total, per year, we save 572 kilowatt hours at the cost of 19.1 kilowatt hours, which nets us roughly 553 kilowatt hours saved per year, which at 12 cents per kilowatt hour saves about $66. That means for me, this project will pay for itself in about a year and a half, which seems pretty good. But depending on your water heater usage and energy cost, your mileage may vary. In a 2020 interview, Bill Gates said that in order for green technologies to take hold, they need to do so automatically and without sacrifice. And this project definitely ticks both of those boxes for me. But what do you think? Is automating your water heater worth it? Let me know down in the comments. Thank you so much to my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support of my channel. And if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.